How's everybody doing this morning? Good? Good? Okay, we're doing good? Awesome. It's great. The weather's kind of dreary outside today. Kind of, yeah, it's gray and yucky and it's kind of cold, right? I'm blaming it on Uncle Gary because he's here today and uh, he, he lives in Rochester, New York. He brought it with him. So we're going to blame him for the weather. He's not in here right now, so we'll blame him for it. Um, no, he's here today. He's going to be preaching for us. He's a missionary. Um, we'll tell you a little bit more about him in a few minutes. Uh, but yes, he is uh, related to my wife. It's uh, her uncle, Uncle Gary. It's her mom's brother. Now, I have to tell you a funny story. When I first met uh, Uncle Gary, because he's a tall fella, just like my wife's father is, I thought they were brothers. You know, they're not. No, it's not. It, it's... It's her mom's brother. And I was forever thinking, okay, these two brothers are going to beat me up because, you know, I'm after <laughs> Tina. And <laughs> her dad tried to run me over with their van. And he missed? He did. He missed. I'll never forget that. We were at a basketball, a basketball and a volleyball game, and me and my future wife were sitting together in the bleachers. Now, we went to a Christian school, so, I mean, we had to, you know, keep a separation and all that stuff. So... After, after the game is over and everything, I'm walking out to my car, and her dad pulls up in this conversion van. They had a conversion van. I still remember the color of it, and I still remember what the front of it looks like very well because it almost ran me over. <laughs> he pulls up and, like, slams on the brakes, and he sticks his head out the window, and he says, Hey, pal, stay away from my daughter. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I told Tina afterwards, I was like, your dad almost killed me in the parking lot. She's like, oh, he's just kidding around. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we're married. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but he still calls me the jerk. <laughs> I'm the jerk that stole his daughter and moved to Florida. So, <laughs> But yeah, no, Gary is her mom's brother. So yeah, even though they're same height, they're same build. Yeah, not brothers. So anyway. We'll tell you a little bit more about uh, Uncle Gary and Aunt Jan. And that's another thing. Every time Gary and Jan were coming to town, we'd always get their names mixed up, and it was Jerry and Gan. Yeah. <laughs> Our family's messed up anyway. <laughs> we're glad you're here this morning. Thank you for taking some time out of your Sunday and spending it with us. Let's all stand this morning. We'll begin singing. This is the day, even though it's gray and nasty outside, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let's sing about it this morning. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord had made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord had made. You know what I'm going to say, right? You know what I'm going to say? This is what I'm seeing. This is the day. We know it's miserable outside, but you don't have to be miserable in here, right? You're in the house of God. You're, you're here gathered together amongst friends and family and relatives, and, and we're singing praises to the Lord. Better than being in the hospital, amen? It's better than the alternative. He, like Fred said, he woke up on the right side of the grass this morning. Amen? 
So they're going to sing that again and just let your face show what you're singing. You know, you don't have to be like, hey, I'll fake and everything. But, you know, sing out a little bit. You know, let the Lord know that you are happy about the day that he's made for you. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. That was good. See, that didn't hurt, right? It's awesome. Now, some of you took it too far and you started clapping. Remember, we're in a Baptist church. Can't be doing that because there's some people that are like, what are they doing? They're clapping their hands. <laughs> That's right. We're in the South. That's right. No, I'm just kidding. Because I mean, when I was a kid growing up in, in church, it was you just didn't do that. You just didn't clap your hands because that was, you know, that's why Baptists have a hard time raising their hands when, you know, you want to praise the Lord. And you're like, oh, it's about as far as I can go because I'm Baptist. <laughs> it's OK. You can clap. You can raise your hands and praise the Lord. It's not a problem. Make a joyful noise. Amen. When we get to heaven, it's the Baptists are going to be in the corner be like, what is going on? Because all of these people in heaven are going to be going crazy. But the, you'll see the Baptists. They'll be in the corner like this. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's keep on singing. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemed. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and Thank you. you. May be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, told Tim to take the day off because uh, I haven't been in the pulpit for a little bit and thought you might need to remember who I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, listen, I appreciate y'all's kindness. Last week, um, last weekend was a time for us to kind of get... Uh, well, we scattered Gretchen's ashes last week, and um, it was a time for our family to be together, and it was a very special time. And you know, Gretchen's up in heaven rejoicing. I guarantee you she does not have her hands at her side, and she is <laughs> hollering and yelling and jumping. And um, shouldn't that be the way it is? Uh, think about this. We're, we're, we're here. We have, if you are a believer in Christ, you have the assurance of heaven. We should be rejoicing. We're redeemed. He took care of that. Uh, we ought to be happy about it. And I don't know what it is. We all end up. <laughs> Me too. I mean, I'm grouchy. I got it. Listen, we have such great, great things going on. God is so good to us. So let's remember that. Maybe we'll change our attitude a bit. Just a few things. Uh, we have a special guests today. They did a great job in uh, Sunday school. And uh, Gary and John Sauer, uh, you've already heard, they're Tina's uncle. And um, I think he's came to straighten out uh, Eric. Uh, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, but listen, there's a lot of things going on. This is a, you know, we're always busy here doing things, um, which is good because it always is about 
getting the gospel to others. This Thursday is MOPS, and those of you involved with MOPS or need to be involved with MOPS or and all, just there's a short meeting right after church, right after service, right over here. Uh, and then Friday we have car show, and we always have a great time at the car show. I heard there's some special stuff going on. Um, Tim's got uh, some very special things planned. And listen, we're going to have a great time. Um, we're going to have snow cones this year, <laughs> along with hamburgers, hot dogs, and all the other stuff. But we got snow cones. And uh, um, we're going to spend some time out this week asking people to donate things as gifts. And if you would like to do that, you could be a great help that way if you know somebody. Um, you got a connection with somebody at a restaurant for a gift card or whatever, uh, something we can give as prizes. And then Saturday is the Sunshine Cinema. And it's, uh, the movie is Cat Baloo. It's one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. I remember as a kid, there's a drunk horse in it. And uh, <laughs> it's worthwhile just to come see the drunk horse. So it's a great time for us to hang out together and just enjoy. Um, and then on April 1st, we do have a sign-up sheet in the back for this, is our uh, Easter outreach from 10 to 12. Uh, we need some people to help set up. We need people to greet. We need people to parking lot manage. We need people to manage the egg hunt crazy. Um, last year we had over 500 people here, and um, there was 500 people who got to get a gospel witness that uh, most likely wouldn't any other way. So we're going to be here. We're partnering again with the county and several other uh, groups will be here. And, uh, but if you would uh, be interested in helping, there's a sign-up sheet on the sign-up table along with a sign-up sheet for uh, Wednesday, or, yeah, Wednesday night meal. It's Dennis's famous, incredible cheesy chicken and rice. So let me see. I think that's about all I have for this morning. Let's, uh, uh, as we go on, let's just get, oh, wait. It's missions month, isn't it? Next week, remember, we have a mission dinner. Uh, it thinks it starts at 5 o'clock. It's a, it's a bring your own. No, We're going to bring and share. It's a potluck. There are some international um, recipes back on the back table where it says pray, I, uh, I pray, I give, I go. And you can take the ones on the paper you can take. If you want to check out a book, write it down because those belong to our house and we want them back. So be sure. But bring an international dish. We'll have a great time of fellowship celebrating missions. And we'll also be uh, taking a promise, a promise of what we're going to do for missions. Um, our missions giving has shifted kind of in the wrong direction in the uh, um, last couple of years. It's kind of gone down and down. So we want to remind you that we, we uh, support missions above our regular giving. Um, and uh, we try to make a commitment every year what God will have us to do. Here's a good story. You may not have any money. My son at one time, and I know I've said it before, but you guys forget things, right? We're older. Or we're, I'm older, and I just repeat things. Both things happen. But uh, my son was in first grade. I know he was in kindergarten, and he made a faith promise of $1 a week. And I'm not going to give that kid any money. But that kid found money every week. Go to the grocery store, he hit the machines, and there was money would come out. He had his dollar every week. God provided it for him. You see, don't be afraid. You can't outgive God. So be praying and asking God what he would uh, have you to do for missions. In the back by the offering box are some cards like this. And uh, take one and pray and see what God would have you to do. All right, I think that's enough for me. It's all you now. Oh, no. If I was only even behind me, I would not have gone. Time for you to sit down, sir. We're changing his name to Pastor Outreach, by the way, if you don't know. Uh, yeah, it is pretty good. Uh, if you come Wednesday night, please, please, please make sure you sign up on the back back there. A couple of weeks ago, I had... 30 people sign up, I fed 45. It's real hard to prepare, uh, so please sign up. Now you say, well, gee, I forgot I won't go. No, if you forget you come, you might get beanie weenie, but you come, okay? Now, this is an old commercial with a new twist. This is a bag. 
This past week, we did almost 200 families, right at about 198 families. Almost 1,000 bags. Now, this is also a bag. And they're different. Now, I know, you're so smart. One is gray and one is black. <laughs> this one is free. This cost us two cents a piece. We used to buy a case of 1000 for $14. Now that same case of 1000 is $24. Much cheaper for you who have 27,000 of these in your garage to bring them in and drop them off. We used almost a case of bags last week because we had almost no bags at all. Now, thankfully, the food bank is doing better than it was doing a month ago. And so we have a wider variety. The wider, the more variety we have of giving out, the more bags that we use. Please, 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 you go look. Our, ba our barrel back there is half empty or half full, any way you want to look at it. But y'all, you, you have them. Most of you throw them away. Bring them in. We need them. We can use them because they are cheaper than these. Okay? You got it? Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. We're changing his name to the bag guy. <laughs> That's all he wants is bags. Hey, his birthday's coming up at the end of the month. I bet you I know what I'm going to get him. A bunch of bags. <laughs> A whole case of bags. Yep, absolutely. That's awesome. Well, when you're in Walmart, I mean, go to the self-checkout. They got them all just sitting there, tons of them. <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can I just say something about Uncle Gary? Uncle Gary is, uh, he's a special guy. He's kind of goofy. He fits with my, my part of the family very well. Um, but he also fits with Tina's family very well as well. But he is the, the uncle that is, was always present. He, they live in Rochester, New York, and they would always, we lived in Connecticut, and they would always come over. A few times a year, they would come over to watch Tina play volleyball and play basketball and all that stuff. And he would preach in our, in our, uh, our chapel services at, at school. But I remember Uncle Gary's being the guy who was always connected to the family. He was always there. And that meant a lot. It still means a lot. Because here we are in South Florida, and every March he comes down, and he makes it a point to stop in and see us. He doesn't have to do that. But it's a free night's sleep for him. You know, you don't have to pay for a hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, and yeah, laundry, they did laundry last night and free food, so you know, they get a little respite, but no, it's, it's just great that he is in our life, and he has been an impact in my life, and I know a, a big impact on my wife's life. Um, he's poured his life into us, and it's something that I don't think he understands how much that really means to us, um, so thank you, Gary and Jan, both of you, um, for what you've done for us personally in our lives. Um, you've, you've been an, an amazing impact, um, even in our in our boys' lives, they're like, Uncle Gary's coming, yeah. We're gonna hear some cool, goofy dad jokes. Cause that's where, where do you think I got it from? Got it from him. So anyway, thank you. Um, you guys have, have just been amazing in our lives. And uh, he's gonna be preaching for us in a few minutes. Um, he's a great student of the word. Um, yeah, he's, he's got an interesting mission. Uh, his mission is to college students, college athletes. And you're like, well, that's kind of, it's, it's America. Why does he need to, I tell you what, America needs to hear the gospel. And kids on college campuses today need it more than they've ever needed it. And he has a, a mission and an opportunity in upstate New York, one of the most liberal states in the, in the country. And he has the opportunity to, to witness and be a witness in the athletes' lives in Rochester, New York, and it's just amazing how God's using him. He's going to share a little bit of that in a few minutes, but pray for him. If the least we can do is pray for him, then that then we're then we're doing more than most churches will do for him. So pray for him and, and Jan as they do their their mission 
up there with athletes. Um, God's using them in, in a different way. Uh, kind of like we get used here in high school, same thing, college level. So pray for him. Let's all stand and we'll sing, I'm a missionary's helper. We we'll get it eventually, Larry. I'm a missionary's helper, praying every day. I'm a missionary's helper, my dollars go God's way. Winning precious souls to Jesus, my heart is all aglow. I'm a missionary's helper, pray and give and go, 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 pray and give and go, pray and give and go, pray and give and go, go, go. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I thank you so much that we have the opportunity to be a missionary's helper, Lord. You've called us all to be missionaries in the area that we are. And not all of us are called to go to a foreign country. Not all of us are called to even go across the country. Help us to be ministers and missionaries where we are, Lord. I pray that you would uh, be with Gary now as he comes and preaches to us, Lord. I pray that you would fill him with your power, fill him with the words to speak. I pray that you would help us to listen, Lord. Help us to expect something from you today, Lord. Help us to pay attention to what you'd have for us. And I just thank you so much for it. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Maybe may be seated. Okay. Um, Eric did really great at uh, doing the introduction, so I don't have much to say except, come on, Gary. <laughs> now? All right, there we go. I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Robert Schuler for the uh, invite to the Plastic Cathedral here. Um, more of a wood guy myself. Uh, the, one of the reasons is I always have these nightmares that uh, wake you up in the middle of the night before you have to preach that you have a wardrobe mal malfunction and everybody else knows about it because it's clear. So, but it is good to be here. My name is Gary Sauer. This is my first wife, Jan. Why don't you go ahead and stand up? The, uh, obviously, the better half of our marriage and ministry. Where is, Fr is it Fred? Yeah, Jan. Uh, Fred came up to me after the service when we told him our age and said, they got married two years before we were born. <laughs> so that means he's been married 28 years. So... But it is good to be here. Uh, where's Brother Dennis? Where's Dennis? Okay. Um, those plastic bags you held up, they are illegal contraband in New York. Yeah. As soon as we hit the border, we throw our bags out the plane so we don't get caught coming back in with them. Uh, but it is a blessing to be here. We, uh, it's been three years now. Uh, obviously since COVID and our different schedules and everything. So Pastor Dale, thank you very much for the invite and the opportunity. Uh, we are missionaries. I don't think I brought my prayer card up with me, uh, but we are missionaries to the athletes, uh, mainly at SUNY Brockport, State University of New York Brockport, which is a uh, you know very, very secular school, uh, state school like in Florida. But uh, from what I've talked to other missionaries, mainly uh, FCA, I believe you have a lot of Fellowship of Christian Athlete missionaries down here. You have a few more uh, leeways or open doors or more leniency uh, in New York. We have found that uh, God has had to bust open some doors for us. And uh, we're blessed. We've seen 27 athletes uh, over our 13 years at the college get saved. Uh, Jan, uh, I came down March 1st, started a routine to travel through Texas. Jan came down March 2nd. The day that I flew down, she met with one of the ladies and led her to Christ uh, before she headed out on her trip. So God has been very good to us. We've enjoyed a number of the athletes and students getting baptized. Uh, God has just performed a, a number of miracles. So 
Uh, the way that you can help us, and there's some things that I cannot elaborate on now, uh, but prayer has changed the climate of our campus. Uh, this past fall, we had four significant prayer requests that has opened the door wider for us and the gospel on campus, and that's because folks like you and other churches and individuals have prayed for us. So uh, stop by our table in the back. Brother Dale, just a suggestion. Put it by the coffee bar. Um, I saw a number of people get their coffee and head to our table, but then they looked down and realized they only already drank half a cup and went back, and they didn't make it. So uh, we'd ask you to make the long trek to New York, or uh, the back of your auditorium. Grab one of our prayer cards, if you would, microwave, refrigerator, bathroom, wherever you spend the most amount of your time. Uh, and put it there so you'll remember to pray for us. Also, we do our newsletters a little bit different. We don't send out a paper letter to churches, uh, but we do send out emails, and uh, we ask folks uh, when we have a big event to pray. The great thing is if we have some kind of special need or emergency and we need prayer for it, we can send it out right away rather than a letter. So we do not give your emails away. The chai comms will not get it. TikTok won't get it. We won't even give it to the guy running Facebook. So your information is safe, but we ask you to get signed up, get our newsletters, and know what's going on. So thank you again, uh, Pastor, for the opportunity. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. It is missions month, so let's, let's talk about missions. Uh, apparently, uh, the missionaries you've had before were pretty short um, because this will probably last through two points and I'll need another one. So I don't know if there's Walmart nearby or something close. So Acts chapter 10, we want to talk about the salvation of Cornelius. And so uh, we're not going to take the time to read the passage. We're going to go through a number of verses here. Hopefully you have your Bible in some form today, electronic or paper, uh, that you can follow along. And uh, just want to see some things that happened. D you, sometimes we forget, and Brother Dale talked about it, you know, the, the rejoicing that goes on in heaven. We ought to rejoice down here when somebody gets saved. If the angels rejoice over one sinner coming to Christ, then we ought to too. And sometimes we forget the miracle. We forget the miracles that have to take place for someone to get to the point that they realize that they need Jesus Christ and accept him as their savior. I grew up as an atheist. Uh, I did not become a Christian until just before turning 20 years old. I tell people, doesn't God have a sense of humor? Take an atheist and put him in the ministry, you know? So, and, and a lot of times I get the opportunity to talk to atheists because somebody says, well, Gary was, so bring him over. And uh, uh, so I didn't have a religious background, but I look back at all the steps. It was about two and a half years of people just witnessing to me and witnessing and loving me, answering my questions. For me, the big thing was prophecy, you know, because as an atheist, I looked at the book as just being a book written by man. That's all it was. It was just to explain, well, down south, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, disease, bad. why do bad things happen to good people? That's all the Bible was. But once you start looking at prophecy and realize the detail and the hundreds and thousands of years before a specific event took place, I had to stop and go, you know, that book is different. So, uh, and you stop and look back at Man, the person had to be here. The person had to know this. I got invited to that. And that, that, are, that encompasses so many miracles to bring somebody to Christ. So when we talk about the salvation of Cornelius, I want you to see all the miracles that took place here to bring that man to Christ and others. So uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. We just ask that you would bless this morning, uh, not just the reading, and the preaching, but God, that you would bless the application of the word in our lives. Open our hearts, open our ears, uh, God, that we would hear and see what you have here. I pray you would set me aside and hide me behind the cross, cover me in your blood. Uh, God, help the thoughts to be your thoughts, the words to be your words, and just use this time for your honor and glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 
So, all right. So salvation of Cornelius. Start here in uh, verse 1. Uh, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now, this Italian band is not a little five-piece combo that goes around doing wedding receptions and bar mitzvahs and stuff like that. This is not, you know, we don't, you know it's not a praise team. The Italian band was a group of soldiers that were sent to protect the tax collector that the Roman government had put in Caesarea. That's why Cornelius was there. Uh, he is a, a centurion, means that he had the, uh, the uh, rule, he had the leadership over a hundred Roman soldiers. That's why they called a centurion, a hundred soldiers. This guy was not a buck private in the Roman army. Uh, this guy was not just somebody that enlisted or conscripted or whatever it may have been. Um, this guy was a mu big muckety-muck in the Roman army. And he was in Israel, in his area, to protect the tax collectors. You know, this is before they had 87,000 armed IRS agents. So he was there to protect them. Obviously, who were paying the taxes? The Jews. They're in a part of Israel, and he's there to collect their taxes. So this guy is not just, you know, first week of boot camp. This guy is up there. This guy is somebody, he's not a nobody, and he had the rule over these hundred soldiers. Sometimes when we look at people that are in politics or they're in sports or they're in, uh, you know, some kind of high up business, we'll, we will say in our heart, we may not verbalize it, they'll never get saved. There's no way the gospel can affect them. There is no way that where they are, the gospel can get to them. Let me encourage you that Cornelius was one of those people that we might say, they'll never get saved. The God, God doesn't know how to get the gospel to him. Isn't that funny to even say or think? Cornelius was up there. He was in charge of a hundred Roman soldiers. Verse 2, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now, I'd love to have that testimony, amen? Uh, so he feared God. He didn't just have a belief in God, but he feared God. He was a good father. It says he feared God with all his house. It says he was a devout man, that he was generous, and he prayed always. And he was lost. He may be doing more for the gospel than some Christians are. He was a lost man, and this story is the story of his salvation, even though he did all these things that many religions would say, that person is a Christian because of their works. But he is a lost person. He's a lost man here. Verse 3, and he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So I don't know if this was the angel of the Lord or just an angel of God. I'm not sure. But he responds, and it either is the angel of the Lord or he knew that that angel was the Lord's messenger and says, what is it, Lord? And he said unto them, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. God noticed his efforts. Isn't that wild? I don't know, Brother Dale, I know you've been in the ministry. Remember, uh, there was a period of time years ago, God doesn't hear sinners' prayers. God doesn't hear lost people's prayers. How about we just go back and believe the Bible? Here, here is a lost guy <laughs> that God hears his prayers. And he's trying to do something about his salvation. And this is not unusual for God. Look at this passage, and I would encourage you to go back into Job 33. It's Elihu who is the author of Job. He is speaking, and if you read from like verse 16 of Job 33 through the end of the chapter, you're going to see all the context for what these verses say. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. Why? 30 to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living. 
You know, we sometimes think, as I said about Cornelius, somebody at that level, God can't get to him. The gospel can't get to him. And here, Job, you know, Elihu speaking in the book of Job says, God does this kind of thing oftentimes. I think we are going to be shocked when we get to heaven to find out how much God was doing behind the scenes to win our family, to win our neighbors, to win our co-workers, our friends, whatever it might be. I think we're going to get up there and go, I didn't realize that was a God moment I missed. There's a God moment. There's a God moment where God is trying to win these people to him. And Job says, it says in Job that God oftentimes, you know, what do we do? We'll hand somebody a track. We'll talk to them in the grocery line. We'll see a neighbor at a, a local, you know, a neighborhood picnic, and we try one time, and we give up. They don't respond. They don't see any fruit. We don't see them asking more questions, and we give up. God doesn't. God does not give up on the lost. It says here, God worketh these things how? Oftentimes. Over and over and over again. Verse 5. And he tells Cornelius, this angel, Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner. So just, just uh, you know, maybe you got some young people in here looking to move out and get your own place or something like that. Don't move in with somebody with the same name, Okay. Yeah, I mean, you're just going to get the mail's going to get confused. Amazon's going to get confused. And, and notice here, the angel's very spe- Could you imagine if the angel wasn't specific and he knocks on the door and go, Hi, I need salmon. Si- Simon. Well, salmon's not bad either. Maybe that's a hint for lunch, Tina. Um, <laughs> salmon, salmon isn't bad. But I need to talk to Simon. Well, which one? The tanner or Simon Peter? Well, I'll go with the tanner. And the, guy, and the guy walks away with a new leather belt. And he never hears the gospel. So if you move in with somebody, try not to have the same name. But he says here, uh, he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Notice he's he's preparing him that this man, Peter, Simon Peter, is going to tell you what to do. Do you realize that God uses people to bring other people to Christ? Churches don't win people to Christ. This is a beautiful building. I know you couldn't afford glass, but this looks nice. You know, you've got nice facilities. You've got beautiful grounds here. And it may have an effect when a visitor comes in to see that you care about the house of God. But this building will never win someone to Christ. But you can. And you can. And you can. And you can. Buildings don't win people to Christ. Now, I understand the people are the church of God. I'm talking about the church does not win someone to Christ. God has given that opportunity to us. Churches do not win people to Christ. Christians do. Romans 10, 14, and how shall they hear without a preacher? It doesn't say how shall they hear without a church. Now, the church is important, obviously. Christ died for the church. But the church is not going to win somebody to Christ. But we can. But we can. So the gospel means good news. So what is this, what is this story? What is this good news? You know, we hear people accept him into your heart or accept him into your life. Just believe in Jesus. Turn your life around. Give God your life. Do unto others and all that. So let's just review the gospel message here. First of all, you've got to realize who Jesus Christ is. 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You say, well, man, that's so hard to understand. Well, join Paul's world. He says it's a great mystery. And it's, there, you, there is going to be controversy about this. Within the first century, the Gnostics were going, like, no, there's no way God could be manifest in the flesh. They're wrong. They're wrong. Just like other religions today say that, no, Jesus was a good teacher. He was a nice guy, handing out lollipops, kissing babies, patting dogs on the head, except the one staying with Tina who wants to eat me. <laughs> John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not was a God, as some of our friends that like to go door to door will say in their Bible. 
He was not a God, he was God. He was God manifest in the flesh. We know from verse 14 of John 1, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and that word is God. So if someone says, I don't believe Jesus is God, they're not ready for salvation. You've got to believe that. Number two, realize that you're a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. I remember uh, uh, something fun I like to do, fun ministry. Uh, you pray when you're in the grocery line and you say, is this the one, Lord? Is this the one? Now, I know a lot of singles do that. You know, is this the one? <laughs> is this? But I, 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 Lord, is this the one that you want me to pay for their groceries so I get a chance to give them the gospel? Is this the one, Lord? So uh, I'm in Aldi and I count. All right, six items, that's the one, Lord. I just know that that is the one right there. And, you know, uh, an older woman found out she was 84, and she's trying to get her card out or her cash or whatever it was. Maybe she had a chip on her hand. Uh, um, so uh, I get up and I swipe, and she's like, what would you do that for? said, I wanted to give you a gift because I have been the recipient of God's great gift of salvation. Well, she, I mean, like, she couldn't, uh, she didn't, she had, a, she had a hard time. So, you know, in Aldi's, you know, get out of line. You know, you got to get the next card and get their back. So we go over to the side there, and I get a chance to talk to her about the Lord, and I say, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. She said, not me. And I asked her her age again. Because if she said 83, I go, well, okay, now you're a liar, so you've sinned. Okay. All right, I, told, I was told I got some boundaries up here. I usually like to move around a lot. I don't go to the gym, but I do aerobics when I preach. I was born for 84 seconds, and I started sinning. Why? I want something. I'm uncomfortable. Feed me. Clothe me. Get all this scum off me. <laughs> I want to live. And she went 84 years, and she said... I've never sinned. She's not ready for salvation. See, if you're not drowning, you don't need a lifeguard or you don't need a flotation device. You have to realize that you're a sinner. And don't feel bad. We're all in the same boat. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then Paul also says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. And that's not just dying. That is Revelation 21. That is the second death where death and hell are cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. So you've got to believe that you're a sinner. Number three, you realize you have to repent of your sin. It means turn from, admit wrong, change of mind, tell God you're sorry. Uh, Acts 17.30, but now commandeth all men everywhere to what? Repent. And then Acts chapter 20, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. It's not a Jewish religion. It's not a pagan religion. It is the religion for every person. What? Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here, here's how I envision it. I'm facing God, and I come to the realization, 20 years old for me, I come to the realization that I am lost and I have sinned against the holy, righteous God. I have broken his commandments. I have disobeyed. I have trespassed his boundaries. And I repent and say, God, I am sorry for my sin. And that, for many people, is where they stop. They feel bad about their sin. They feel bad about their lifestyle. They, they flog themselves all the time. I'm such a sinner. But they never do the second half. Repentance toward God turn from my sin, and then faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have some people, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. Well, did you repent of your sin? No, I just believe. Sorry. You got to, you know, when I, as a kid, uh, not every pitch was a strike, and I'd throw the ball through the glass window of our garage doors, you know, back then. I was, you know, not kicked out of the house or anything like that. But I had to make that right with my dad to continue the good relationship. So I've got to tell God I am sorry for my sin and then realize I can't save myself and put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then four, you realize you can't earn your salvation. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, what? Not of works, lest any man should boast. We looked at the first half of Romans 6.23. The second half is, is the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it is a gift. You think about the Ethiopian eunuch who's trucking along there and God miraculously brings Peter into his life and he's reading this passage in Isaiah and he says, I don't understand it. And Philip says, well, let me explain it to you. And he's going through who Jesus is in the gospel and the eunuch with a, with a works mentality says, here is water, what doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip says, you got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ first. Your works aren't going to save you. When you think about the thief on the cross, you know, for about half the time, half of the six hours that they hung there, both thieves were getting on Jesus. They were mocking him out and ridiculing him. You know, you saved others, save yourself, you know, like that. And then about halfway through, after you hear the creator of the universe say, Lord, forgive them, they know not what they do. You don't say that when you're being crucified. You say, God, get them for putting me here. And that thief listened to the last seven phrases of Jesus when he was on the cross and said, that's the real deal. And what does the thief ask him? Remember me this day when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, you need to go to church. You need to get off the cross and get baptized. What, Mr. Thief, what did you give last year for your faith promise missions? <laughs> See, I'm trying to, you know, go with the theme. Is that helping all? Okay. He, he goes, hey, 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 you know, have you been baptized, catechized, pastorized? You know, have you, have you, how many old ladies have you walked across the street? He didn't say any of that. He said, this day, thou shalt be with me in paradise. So he did not have to work. We do not have to work for our salvation. Can you imagine where, you know, you might be able to out jump me, but you can't jump to the moon. See, all have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. It's not whether, you know, you know, this is, you know, when I, I was going through that phase of like, okay, maybe there is a God, you know, and trying to figure it out. And I, and I thought, well, maybe I'll get the H's. You know, we get up to the judgment, and I'm on one side of the scale, and maybe I'll get Hitler. You know, and then maybe I'll have a chance of getting in. I know I didn't kill six million Jews. Then it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, Gary's on one side. Jesus Christ is on the other side. How in the world could I measure up to that? Of course, we know from 2 Corinthians 5.21 that he took my sin and gave me his righteousness. That's how I'm going to get in. So it's a gift. It's a gift. You need to receive the gift. John 1.12, but as many as received him... To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever, I am so glad, that whosoever's can get in. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So maybe you're here today, you're visiting. Uh, maybe you've been in church a while and still think there's some works involved with your salvation or other things like that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe you're watching at home or somewhere on the internet. You need to accept Jesus Christ's free gift. I've never had to pay for any of my gifts that I've received, birthdays, Father's Day, Christmas coming up, Father's Day. Uh, I've never had to pay for my gifts. And you don't have to pay for the gift of salvation either. So that was the message that God tasked Peter with delivering. Go back one, guys, if you would, leave it there. All right, so now let's go on, verse 7. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. 
And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went, now notice this, he has the vision from the angel or the angel of the Lord. He's got this conversation. They tell him to go down to Joppa and find Simon Peter. And then Cornelius gets a couple of his servants and a soldier to protect them. And they travel to Joppa. And at the same time, God's working on Peter. That's what we're reading here in verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. You know what Peter was doing? He was doing his devotions. He went up to the top of the house, get some quiet time, get away from all the noise, the coffee maker, the oven, everything. And he just went up there to get some quiet time to do his devotions. Verse 10, and he became very hungry, Baptist, all right, and would have eaten, but, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. See, that's the problem when you room with a tanner. He should have roomed with Simon the baker. They would have had their meals on time. It would have tasted good. He wouldn't have been hungry. But, you know, you move with a tanner. What are you doing? Oh, I'm getting the salmon ready. You know, just beating the tar out of the thing. So he gets up there, and he's hungry. And he hasn't eaten, and he falls into this trance. In verse 11, And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the the voice, excuse me, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed. That call not thou not thou common. And this was done thrice, and the vessel received up into heaven again. You know what God was doing? God was using this illustration to break Peter of his religious and cultural biases against the Gentiles. Remember, at this point, yes, the Ethiopian eunuch got saved in eight. Uh, Paul gets saved in nine. And Peter wasn't part of those two things. And he's still struggling with all these cultural issues. And I'm going to go to a Gentile and give him the gospel? But you know what? We struggle with those same biases ourselves. There are certain people groups that we struggle with bringing the gospel or making a sacrifice so that they can hear the gospel. Maybe we need to look at the loss differently Maybe we need to look at the lost like God does. It says in Ezekiel 33, 11, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Sometimes we go, boy, I'm glad they're dead. They were really bad. They were really wicked. They, they did a lot of bad things. God doesn't feel that way. God knows what the consequences of someone dying without Christ, what that brings them for all eternity. And sometimes we have to get over our religious and our cultural biases to bring the gospel to every creature throughout the world. That's why we have missions conferences, to help us focus on the role that Sunshine Baptist can play in bringing the gospel around the world. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is what? Long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. That's, that's what missions is in our heart, that we're not willing that any should perish, no matter where they are on the globe or what they're like. All right. Verse 17, now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, lodged there. So think about the timing. God oftentimes, what he does to bring the gospel. So Cornelius the day before has this vision, talking with this angel, He sends two of his servants and a soldier, and the next day, while God is working on Peter, while he's doing his devotions, 
See, that is what's cool about watching God work and not feeling like we have to do everything. Just, can you, I mean, you just get this vision from God, the animals coming down, rise Peter, kill and eat. It sounds like a great verse for a buffet. And, 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 and then at the same time, God says, I'm going to send you somebody. And there they are. See how God is working behind the scenes? And, and if the Holy Spirit had not recorded this story, we wouldn't have seen, we wouldn't have known any of it. Such detail. Notice the timing. God was working out all the details behind the scene. Verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So may I just say this, you know, the, the big, uh, you know, trying to figure out the will of God in our lives. Here's what a lot of Christians will do. Circumstances. And then they say they pray about it, and then they go find a verse. Can, can I show the pattern here? The pattern here is Peter's doing his devotions. He's praying. He may have an, a portion of the Old Testament scriptures with him. He's reading, and then the circumstances confirm the Word of God in his life. So my suggestion is when you're trying to determine the will of God, just continue doing every day what God's told you to do. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So first of all, you just do your devotions. Let God through his word impress things on you. And then I believe he'll bring the circumstances to confirm it like he did here with Peter. Notice that God gives him direction with no directions. You know, uh, uh, I think one of the biggest things that have happened in our marriage that has not been beneficial is getting a GPS device that talks. And uh, Jan, uh, and of course it's a female voice, so Jan gets a little jealous and, and upset. And sometimes that thing will take me, I mean like, it's like the store, Dunkin', it happened yesterday, Dunkin' Donuts is right here. Oh, okay, well let me take you around Lakeland over behind Winter Haven, back up, and I'm going to put you right here, and there's Duncan. <laughs> so notice God gives him directions. Go. Well, where? Just go. This is like Abraham's call. You, can you imagine expl him explaining to Sarah, got to start packing. Why? Going on vacation? I don't know. Uh, where are we going? I don't know. How long are we going to be there? I don't know. What, I mean, what are we going to take? We're going to take the camel? We're going to take the GT? We're gonna, what are we? I don't know. Just start packing. God's direction without direction. Sometimes he's very ambiguous. 21, then Peter went down to the men which were sent him, uh, unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? Why did you wake me up from my trance? I was doing my devotions. Why are you bugging me? He says, so what's the reason you came? God didn't reveal to him why, why they were there. But the circumstances matched the word and prayer. God didn't reveal why they were there. Just, he, Peter just had to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading. Sometimes we don't obey unless we have all the details or unless we know there are guaranteed results. That is not living by faith. If we have to have all the details or, God, I'm not going to go do this this car show thing and stand out in the sun and, you know, I don't want to give up a Saturday night, is it? Friday night, okay, you know, uh, happy hours, five to nine, I'm going to lose all my half-price drinks. Uh, I'm not going to, sorry, just, just, I get my medication changed tomorrow. Things should be better after that. So I'm not going to go to this car show thing. I, 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 they just want me to sign up. I want to know what I'm going to do. Am I going to drive the vet? No, no, you're going to work in the parking lot with the orange batons. That's all you're, I don't have all the details. I'm not, that's not living by faith. That's not living by faith. Peter didn't know where he was going, who was coming, what he was going to do. God just said, go. Therefore, it becomes a step of faith for him. Verse 22, we're almost done, and then we'll get to part two. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews. They knew how to butter Peter up here. 
this guy liked the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And verse 24, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and he called together his kinsmen and near friends. So here's, here's our conclusion. Number one, opportunities become apparent when we're in communion with God. What was Peter doing? Look at verse 9. What was Peter doing at the time God revealed this opportunity to him? He was up on the housetop doing his devotions. You just walk with God. Abide in Christ. Abide in the vine. Dwell with him. Just just do what God has revealed to us to do day by day. That's a great study, the word daily in the New Testament, the things that we're told to do. I just don't know and when and how. Just abide in Christ. Just do your devotions and don't check it off. Oh, I got that done just in case preacher asked me Sunday. <laughs> no, I, I think two verses and monumental effort. I think God wants a little more out of us. Devote, devotions, try that with your wife. Give your wife two verses of devotion for a year and see how that goes. Matthew 9, 37, then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is, truly is what? Do we believe that? Do we believe that at Brockport? Do we believe that at your local high school? Do we believe that where you work? That the harvest, Jesus, is Jesus a liar? This is what he said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the what? I have a sneaky suspicion. That's why we don't pray about missions. Because we may be afraid that God will tap us to go to a college campus when we're 51 years old. Doesn't that fit the modern model? We have no idea why God did it, but boy, are we having a ball there. Pray ye therefore the Lord of harvest, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You know, I thought, somebody's not praying and somebody's not obeying. If there's lost people, we still have work to do. Number two, number two. Don't worry about having all the details. Just obey what you know. You look at verse 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Does anybody remember what happened to Peter in chapter 5? He gets arrested and gets the snot beat out of him. And threatened that if you preach the gospel again... We're going to give you round two. Peter's life and imprisonment has been threatened for four or five chapters now, and I don't know the period of time there, but Peter's, you know, so here's Peter, uh, you know, to, okay, who are the two guys? Oh, you're servants of Cornelius, uh, you with all the armor. Uh, what is that for? Dude with the funny hat and the frizzy tail, wh- what are you here for? Peter didn't know what to expect. How long would it take? God didn't tell him. Uh, Would it be a waste of time? God didn't tell him. What happens if it was a Roman trap? He thought, okay, they couldn't get me from street preaching, so now they'll get me into a government official's house and arrest me there under the pretense of hearing words of thee. He's like, man, this could be a trap. Man, I can't witness at work. I might get fired. I can't, I can't hand out tracts in my neighborhood. The, the homeowners association may have a cow. Well, then just say, rise, Peter, kill and eat, and have some hamburgers. <laughs> See, what do we do? We get afraid. We get afraid. Here's Peter. This, is, this could be a trap. They're going to kill me. And he goes because he was doing his devotions, praying, reading, and the Word of God told him to go, and the circumstances fit, and he said, if this is it, this is it. I might get rejected. 
They might ask me a question I can't answer. Listen, did everybody you ask out say yes? So why all of a sudden, and I know some of you are struggling to remember that day, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but <laughs> you weren't afraid of rejection then, right? Did you, uh, thank you. Did you, uh, did you make every team you tried out for? Did you get every job you applied for? Did you? Yeah. And all of a sudden, when it comes to spiritual things, we're worried about the results. And we just need to obey. Notice that somebody might get saved. Maybe a bunch of people will get saved. How about um, Ephesians 3.20? Now unto him that is able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly. Do we have the right one up? Sorry, guys. There we go. Now unto him... Uh, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we want, and even, they'll never get saved. It's Cornelius. He's a high-ranking government. No, see, that's not the way God works. That's not the way God works. Last point, realize you are the voice of God in someone's life. Look at verse 5. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So he tells Cornelius, he gives, Peter, he gives him Peter's address, his cell number, uh, his Instagram account. He gives him his Facebook page. He gives him everything he needs, and he tells him right where he lives. God, God gave Cornelius all of that information to go find Peter. So why didn't God witness to him himself? Who would have done a better job? Who would have done a better job witnessing to somebody, God or Peter? Right? And God didn't witness to him because you're the witness in that person's life. Think about that. Who could lead those athletes to Christ better than Gary and Jan? Hmm, God. And God didn't come down to the campus. He sent us. God didn't come down to, where are we? I've been so many cities. Port Charlotte? Port Charlotte, thank you. God sent you to Port Charlotte. God's not witnessing to the neighbor. He's working behind the scenes. He's softening hearts. He's causing circumstances so he can send you into their lives to bring them the gospel. God, why don't you do something? And God's sitting there going, yeah, why don't you do something? God did not witness to Cornelius, and he sent a frail, religiously prejudiced, cultural prejudiced, Man, frail, human, sinful, worries, concerns, sent him to bring the gospel to Cornelius, just like he has sent all of us to Port Charlotte and the towns around here to bring them the gospel. Amen? So let me just show you the effort that Peter... I thought we had this worked out, boys. No lunch for you. So how far was this? Let me just, you know, we're going, oh, Caesarea to Joppa. What is that, from here to Northport? Is that here to, what were some of the cities you named? Punta Gorda, uh, Punta Ball, you know, or throw it, whatever you got to do in the game to win. So do you know how far it is from Caesarea down to Joppa? It's 39 miles. One way. One way. No tolls, fortunately. 39 miles. Do you know how fast the average person walks? It's about three miles an hour. Now, I get about three and a half. Got a little bit longer stride. Okay. So some people go, yeah, but maybe they, maybe they took the, the uh, eight-cylinder camel. You know, they really just cranked that. Now, do you know, so I did some research. You know how fast, unless you have them run or there's a snake by their feet, do you know how fast a camel walks, just walking? Three miles an hour. I know, they took the sport model donkey, you know, with the big mags, got the pipes hanging out the back, convertible, just pull the ears down. Brrr. 
Do you know how fast a donkey walks? Three miles an hour. So whether they did it on hoof, their feet, or somebody else's hooves, it would take them 39 hours. No, it would take them 13 hours at three miles an hour to go 39 miles. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> you know, here's a thought. Time out. Little dog collar, you know, invisible fence. <laughs> uh, get them back up on the stage. Sorry. So are you willing to drive to Northport? You willing to go to Punta Gorda? Sarasota? Are you willing? Remember, he, this could have been a Roman trap. And he still could. How awkward. You think it's hard traveling with kids. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You got a Roman soldier, probably re related to the one that you were shackled to in chapter 5. Awkward. This guy might want to kill me. <laughs> so what do you do for a living? I'm an executioner. Oh, happy day. 13 hours of travel, one way. You know what happened when they got there? <laughs> He's thinking, okay, so I got to go say words to Cornelius. Come to find out, Cornelius got all his family, all his friends, and that room was full, and they all got saved that day because somebody was willing to go. So, What does a soul cost? What is a soul worth? All you have to do is look at the cross of Christ to determine that. But we don't. We look at the mileage. We look at gas prices. We look at the time. We look at maybe being rejected. And we say, it's not worth it. But God may be calling you into a room where you're going to lead several people to Christ that you had never met before if we just obey. Pastor? Always got to be careful with that mic. Listen, you just heard the gospel presented. So the first question, is this something you believe? Let's see. Philippian jailer asked uh, Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do you believe the gospel? That's the first question. You've seen it presented. You've seen all the parts that go with it. Do you believe? If you're here and you've never believed, don't leave here that way. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again to forgive your sins. If you believe that, then be obedient to him when he says go into all the world and preach the gospel. You have contact with people all around you. Share with them. What was it? It was his story. Your story and his story and people will come. That's what missions is. Yes, we send people all over the world to declare the gospel. But we must declare it here to the people that we have. Let's stand We're going to sing a song of invitation. We still do that here. Um, if you would like for someone to pray for, you can come forward. We'll pray. There are cards in the back of the pockets of the chairs. There are next steps. If you want someone to contact you, to talk to you, if you have more questions, fill that out. Put it in the offering box at the back. Whatever your need may be, be obedient to the Lord. Be obedient and do what needs to be done now. Oh, 
to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender Go back to the, um, uh, his table, get prayer cards so you can keep praying. Don't forget all the things going on, and um, let's go out and share the gospel with somebody this week, or even this afternoon. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, the word that explains how much you love us, how much you care for us. The word that tells us that you came to this earth and that you lived a perfect life, giving that life, taking on the punishment of our sin upon you. And that you conquered sin and you conquered death. You were buried and you rose again to forgive us. May we understand that we need to be forgiven. And may we believe in that death, burial, and resurrection. And Lord, may we rejoice in the gift of eternal life that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all are dismissed.